Uh, just to start, my name is Tanya Shear, and I'm the school program manager at Gateway Greening. Um, a little bit, if you're not familiar with Gateway Greening, I know some of you may not be joining us locally from the St. Louis region, but we are a nonprofit whose mission is to educate and empower uh, the community through gardening and urban agriculture. So we were established as a 501c3 nonprofit in 1984. Um, we currently have over 200 garden projects in our network. So you can see the map here, it's also on our website um, where you can see different orchards, school gardens and community gardens that are in our network. Um, we also have 17 of those that are part of our land trust program. And we do a lot of free education uh, for the community. So um, including this webinar, hopefully we can get back to doing some in-person classes soon as well too. So just briefly about our school program. Um, so we, if you are in the St. Louis region and you want to um, join our network or start a new garden at your existing youth or school program, you can contact us um, on our website, fill out the new project interest form. And once you go through our four phase development process and you're considered in our network, you have a lot of perks such as these. Um, you can apply each year to expand your garden. You also will get an initial garden installation. Um, we can set you up with volunteer groups if you have large projects coming up. We have a tool loan program. Schools and youth programs get free seeds and seedlings from us for the garden. Lots of other perks. You can learn more about that on our website if you're interested. Let's get going with the webinar. So just a little housekeeping. Um, this is being recorded. Also, since this is in webinar mode, I cannot see or hear any of you. So if you have um, any comments throughout, I'm going to ask that you can drop comments or if you have some um, things you'd like to share, you can use the chat box. But preferably, if you have questions, if you can use the Q&A box, it's just a little, a little easier to keep up with them if they're in the Q&A. If you accidentally drop one in the chat, that's fine, too. Um, I'll try to take some time at the end, as depending how much time we have to go through and see if any of you have any questions. Um, let's see. So I guess just before I start, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I mentioned I'm a school program manager. I do have a background in teaching, um, but not in art. So I love art. It's a hobby of mine, as is gardening, um, but that is not what I taught before coming to Gateway Greening. And even now, I don't always do art. I do a lot more science when I'm working with students out in the garden. Um, but again, art's a hobby of mine, and I thought this would be um, kind of a, a change up, a fun fun webinar to do to show you, you know, there, there are other things besides just science or math that you can use a garden for. Really, you can use the garden for any content area. Um, so again, because I my background is not in art, I'm not an expert on these things, um, but these are all activities that I have tried uh, myself or with youth. Um, so but there are a lot of variations on different things, like when we talk about natural dyes. So, um, you know, feel free to consult the internet or books if you really want more of a deep dive. We're just gonna kind of touch on some different things just to kind of uh, get your brain going and maybe give you some basics that you can start with if you're wanting to do more art activities in the garden. So goals of this session. I'm hoping by the end of this, you will have, of course, learned some new activities that you can do in your outdoor classroom or in your garden space. And again, when, when I say garden, um, I like to think a little more broader that even if you don't have a garden in your school, if you have any kind of good green space that most of these can be done if you have plants growing. Um, I also hope that you'll know a little bit more maybe about just basics of weaving, printmaking, and dyeing using natural materials. And of course, I hope that you will understand why using the garden or an outdoor classroom space is beneficial as opposed to just um, having art class inside. So that being said, why bring your art out into the garden? There's a much longer list of reasons I could give you than these uh, you see, but just to start, and then for one, when you're outside, you're engaging multiple senses. And we all, all know the more senses that are engaged, it's usually um, going to be a richer learning experience. So, you know, you have all the different textures and smells and colors and sounds just by being outside. And that can also uh, make that experience more longer lasting um, in the memory too. So also just working in the garden, you know, whether it's doing art or gardening in general, it's generally going to strengthen a child's appreciation for nature. You know, when they're nurturing things or when they're really interacting with plants, they're more likely to want to um, care for those, care for the earth later in life. 
Um, also, just encourage, it encourages a deeper, deeper average, I'm sorry, observational skills. So when you're looking at a leaf in a new way, not just as a leaf, but maybe really looking at it at the textures and the colors, um, you're really sharpening those observation skills. Of course, making art outside is going to create a sense of beauty. And if you're planting flowers and things you can use for art, it's just going to beautify the space. Um, it's again creative medium for making connections so even if you're teaching art there are lots of different like historical connections you know you might be using math if you're doing measurements um, with dyes or things like that so even if you're focusing on art you can really um, bring in those different content areas when you're doing art outside and last two last but not least it requires few materials so most of these activities won't require much more than maybe some string um, some glue, a few things here and there that you may need to bring, you know, from home or from your art, art room, but most of it focuses on using found items in nature. And of course, it's much, e much easier to clean up if you're, if you're painting or you're doing some kind of messy activity outside than if it's in your classroom. So before you really um, just dive into it. I mean, you certainly can just dive into taking art outside, but if you really want to make it kind of a focus for the next school year, it's a good idea to kind of think ahead and think about what projects do you want to use a garden for uh, when it comes to art. So consider your goals, you know, what is it? Are you wanting to focus on dyes, making natural dyes? Are you wanting to focus on um, maybe like a more sensory uh, plants that you can grow? So think about what your goals are ahead of time. Um, and then you can kind of start planning to plant different flowers and vegetables according to what you're wanting to um, do in the garden. So also think about what do you already have out there? Do you have a big oak tree that, you know, will be useful for leaf projects, you know, the seeds, all that good stuff? You know, what, what do you already have out there that you can work with? Um, think about what items you also have that could be repurposed in the garden. So we'll talk about, like, um, we'll talk a little bit about a loom, putting a loom out in the garden, you know, do you have like some old frames laying around, some window frames or things like that that you could use for some of these projects. And also consider the seating and the space you have. So where do you want to um, do these art projects? You know, do you need to maybe bring in some picnic tables or some kind of mats for the kids to sit on so they can be comfortable doing art outside? Just thinking ahead will always make, make it easier. And of course, safety first. So, um, I highly encourage you to really know your space. You know, if it's if you're not, you don't have a space that you currently do a lot of outdoor classes in, but you want to start that, really familiarize yourself with that space. So um, think about what are the boundaries. If you're taking a class out there, where where is considered off limits? How far can they roam if they're looking for materials? So you know that's based on your individualized needs. But I'd really have that. Um, planned ahead of time, think about, you know, are you going to tell them don't go past this bush or stay 10 feet, you know, from the road. Um, but think about that ahead of time and make sure you lay those rules from the very beginning and repeat them every day so that um, the students know what's off limits and what's not. And also familiarizing yourself with what is in the garden, you know, that could be toxic. You know, daffodils are a very beautiful flower and I see them in a lot of school gardens, but they're extremely they can, I think they can, they can kill you, you know, if you eat, I don't know if it's one or two, but they're, they're very toxic if they're eaten. So, you know, make sure you know what is safe and the kids know, you know of course, kids should never be eating anything in the garden without adults permission, but we, we know how children can be sometimes. Um, so just make sure you really know what you have out there. And if they're going to be working with a certain flower for something, you know, you know, if it's toxic, if it can cause allergic reactions, all that good stuff. So now that we have all, all that stuff out of the way, we can talk about some different art projects. So I, I put this, we, I think most all of us have heard the quote, the earth without art is just eh, eh, which I love, but I like to think even more so the earth can't be without art because the earth is a work of art. So it's a great, nature's a great place to really tie in a lot of um, concepts you might be teaching in art. You know, we have symmetry and patterns and I mean, all these vibrant colors. So. I like to think of them as not even being separate from each other, but you know, the earth is a work of art and it's a great place to teach that. So to start, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about weaving. So using the garden for weaving. So uh, you see a picture of a really large kind of scale uh, loom over here on the right. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, but just a little history on weaving. 
So it is known to be one of the oldest and most ancient surviving arts in the world. Um, there's evidence that prehistoric man actually was making string and rope um, out of natural fibers. Um, it's also something that has long been associated with the family unit um, because, you know, originally families were not able to go to the store and buy clothes they needed. So families were very individualized or individually making um, textiles based on what their family needs were. So it's long been associated with, you know, generational kind of um, skills that have been passed down and the whole family would be involved in that um, kind of weaving production of textiles in their house. Um, I went and saw a really great talk with a Navajo textilist. Her name was Melissa Cody. And she talked a lot about, she's, I think, a fourth generation weaver. So it's, you know, it's an art to us, but to her, it was just something she was raised doing. And even to this day, um, she makes these beautiful pieces that, you know, are in art galleries, but uh, her dad still hand makes all of her looms. So um, lots of good storytelling that comes along with that, you know, and the family's all working together on this craft. Um, and of course, weaving was originally done by hand until looms were created. And the earlier looms were, you know, just wooden frames um, until they later became the larger machines. So before we talk about just doing like some um, creating a garden loom, I want to talk a little bit about making cordage or rope. Um, so a lot of people think of, a lot of times you hear about this when you're thinking of like survival skills or bushcraft. And I'm not going to go into it um, as in depth with that, because again, this is more for art and this is intended to be stuff that children can do. So it's really interesting if we're into that kind of thing to learn more about it and maybe do more of a deep dive, but I'm just gonna go over a very basic technique um, so that you can teach students if they wanna make rope to then use for bracelets or basket handles or weaving an art uh, outdoor loom, you know, whatever you might wanna use that for. So on the left, I have some plants that are known to be good um, for making rope or cordage. There are many others, um, but ones I have tried are milkweed, the yucca. So milkweed, it would be the stem that you would use, the stalk. Um, you kind of split it open and has a lot of those strong fibers. Uh, the yucca would be the leaf, which you can see up here at the top. This is a yucca leaf. Um, and then I've also done daylily. So I had some fresh daylily leaves here and then some that were already dried out here. Um, but also stinging nettle, red cedar, and dogbane are known to be good for making cordage also. So a little bit more about it before I kind of show you how to do that. Um, one thing to understand when you're going to start making rope or cordage is that plants consist of both starch and fibers. And starch, uh, the starches are the parts that have the nutrients and those will break down and dry up over time as the plant dies. Uh, the fibers, you know, are those, are those the stringy, um, tougher parts within the plant and those take a lot longer to break down. So because of that, it is important to generally use dry um, plant material if you're doing this, because of course you can see, I gave an example here um, you can see, I think this may have, I don't know if these are both yucca or if it was yucca and daylily, but you can see the green examples on the left. They were really beautiful pieces of cordage when I made them, um, but two days later after they started to dry up, they lost their shape because of course it's kind of shrinking and so it started to unravel a little bit. So that's what's going to happen if you use uh, fresh, fresh leaves. And that doesn't mean you can't use them. If you're just doing it for like a one day project, you certainly can, you know, again, if you're trying to use this for something that's gonna last longer, it's better to, to use dry stuff. So that's why this can be a great project for uh, fall, fall and winter when plants are dying. Um, so the one on the right, I believe is the daylily leaf because that was really all I could get my hands on this time of year um, that would work well that was dry already. So you could get some of these leaves ahead of time and dry them out yourself also. So that being said, I'm gonna actually, I was going to put a video here, but I'm just going to stop sharing and kind of show you um, a basic technique. And I know I just said it's best to use dry, but because I, I think it's a little easier to show you with um, a thicker kind of, um, this, the yucca leaf, which isn't totally dry, I'm just gonna use this. So it's kind of do as I say, not as I do, um, just so I can, um, Give you an example of the method to use. 
So again, this probably wouldn't hold up over time. Oh, let me stop sharing. Well, first I'll just kind of read over um, the method to twisting it. So what you're going to do is start by taking your leaf or your stem, uh, whatever your plant fibers are, and you're going to fold it in half. And if I wanted, I could make this longer by attaching multiple, but um, I don't need that. And basically, I, I will enlarge the screen in just a minute. You're going to twist one side of it away from you and the other side towards you until you start to get a little, ooh, let's see, a little ring. And then you're gonna pinch that. And that's gonna be kind of your starting point. You can twist it so there's no gap in there. And then you're just going to take, let's see, a little difficult to do on a screen. You're going to take the side that is away from you and you're going to twist it away from you. And then you're gonna cross it over the other piece. Now this piece is away from you and you're going to twist it away and then cross it over. And as you're doing this, you're gonna keep sliding your thumb down to kind of pinch it. So I'll stop sharing and show this a little closer. So let me go back. So here is my, um, it's just a strip of my yucca leaf, fold it in half. And then I'm gonna twist one side away and one side towards me until it starts to curl. And that's gonna be my little spot I'm gonna pinch. And again, take, you can see two pieces, take the piece that is away from you, twist it away and then cross it over the other one. And then twist this one away and cross it over. And you just continue doing that all the way down. Once you do it long enough, you kind of get a little method, it goes pretty quickly where your thumb just kind of slides the other one away from you. So twist away and pull it over. And then you just kind of can keep going. I won't do this whole piece. So I don't want to take up too much time, but you'll see, you can see here. Hopefully that's zoomed in. You can see where you're starting to get that kind of braid pattern. That would, if it were dry, look like this. So here is one that I did, a dry daily leaf. And you can also, again, this is just more kind of a quick method for art projects. Um, you can do what I believe they call buffing beforehand. Um, so to get like some of the, the starches out and kind of clean it up, rub it between your hands, or you can even do it after because you can see just like, it's not the prettiest. There are some little shaggy pieces. So I could kind of clean that up if I wanted, but I don't mind that. So here is um, just a little piece that I do a day lily and get it to zoom in. It's very strong. So I'm not breaking it and I'm pulling it pretty hard. It even kind of has a little bounce sound to it where you almost could maybe even make like um, instruments with it, you know, some strings to pluck. So it kind of has a bass sound to it. Um, but it's very strong. I could use this, you know, to tie and make bracelets, maybe even weave some flowers or beads on it. You know, I could make longer pieces. I could use them for I said, basket handles. You could use them for actual weaving. So lots of different things that you can then do with that. Um, another thing I was going to mention, well, I have some, some yucca leaves here. You can see yucca leaves are really good because they're so strong. They are pointy though. So you want to be careful with that because um, they're pretty they're pretty tough, so that point can be a little painful. So you want to be cautious of that. You know, if you're working with these with kids, um, but you can already see all the fibers. So those things that look like strings, those are the fibers of the plant. And if you have fresh yucca leaves, you can also remove, kind of start removing some of that starch to help it dry out quicker um, by just taking a spoon. You can't really see this, but I'm just going to scrape it. I'm going to put it on a hard surface and just kind of start scraping the yucca leaf. I'm getting like that wet kind of starchy stuff off. And then you'll see, uh, I don't know if you can see that. Um, you can just, you'll start to see the fibers exposed. So you're kind of getting rid of that wet stuff and it'll help it dry out quicker. Um, or you could even just try making cordage that way. Again, if you just need, want to use it, for one day, it doesn't have to be dry, but if it's something you want to hold up over time, it's good to dry that out first. Let's see, go back to my presentation.
Okay, so that's just the basics of making rope. So these are some different ones I, I did. You can see where they kind of go from fresher to, to drier. So next I'm gonna talk a little bit about making a garden loom. So I have worked with a school for a little while and the art teacher actually gave me this idea. She, she had a very big old window frame that she brought out to the garden and just put string across it and had this large um, garden loom that students could, whenever they're out in the garden, just weave stuff into it. So very easy and simple to do. Um, you could do that yourself if you want to put a, a large loom out in the garden and just hang it, you know, from a tree or um, she actually had an old like swing set stand she hung it from, uh, but you could hang it from anything. And um, it's really fun too. You can kind of tie in like if you're teaching about seasons, you know, to let students weave different items from the garden in the loom. And maybe they could even journal about it, um, about, you know, where they found those different objects and um, how it looks different from season to season, how the colors change. Um, you could also tie it to decomposition if you let students weave in the loom and then um, kind of track over time how those materials change in color and how they break down. Um, but if you want to just also have students create their own individualized one, all you need are four sticks with some twine. So I had to include a picture of my dog here because as I was um, making this loom, he saw the little uh, ball of twine moving around on the floor and I guess thought it was an animal and took off with it. So I, I thought that was very cute. But basically all I did was take four sticks, um, use the twine to connect the sticks together into a rectangle or a square, and then I just looped it around. So a very easy, basic loom. And then I just took some natural objects and weaved them through. So you could uh, make a bunch of your own cordage and even you could even dye these, do different things to change the colors and have students, you know, practice kind of weaving with their nature loom. Or you can just let them get creative and find different objects around the garden to weave in and out of their own little loom. And I thought this made kind of a fun little window, almost like a sun catcher. Um, but that's the basics of uh, making garden of loom for the garden. Now I'm going to go on to dyeing. Um, so this one I've not done a lot with, but I have done a little bit. Um, but please feel free if you have with any of this stuff, if you have tried any of this or you have tips or tricks, please drop it in the chat because um, I would love to learn more from all of you as well. So a little bit about dyeing, uh, natural dyeing, you know, it goes back over 4,000 years. Some reports say much, much further back, um, but I know, yeah, I, I don't want to give misinformation. So um, I, at least 4,000 years back, natural dyeing. And of course, dyeing was originally done with plant parts using all natural pigments, for, pigments from different plants. Um, and it, it continued to be natural dyes that were used well through the 1800s. So there were a few different things that affected um, the use of natural dyes. One um, being coal, um, but also the industrial revolution kind of sparked a demand you know, for more textiles. So they needed to find dyes that could be created quickly and also cheaply. So that's kind of when around that time was when synthetic dyes started taking off. And today, unfortunately, 90% of our clothes are, are dyed synthetically. So this is a fun one to um, use and teach students about, you know, it's a great history lesson in there. Um, but I will say one thing, you know, of course, natural dyes, they don't hold as well. There are ways you can definitely bring in chemicals to kind of treat the fabric so that it does hold uh, the dye longer, but I'm trying to keep this natural for the sake of this webinar. So um, I think that if you're going to do this, it's definitely probably better to do with like a fabric that you are gonna use more as a piece of art, probably not something you're gonna wear and wash over time because those colors will, fat or will fade. So this is just a long list. And again, this webinar is recorded. So you'll be able, well, we should have it uploaded to our YouTube tomorrow. You'll be able to come back and look over this list. But I'll give you a little time to browse over it or if you wanna screenshot it. Um, these are just some different plants. Um, so vegetables, um, fruits and flower parts or plant parts, flowers, also some leaves in there that can be used to create different shades. So the ones I have worked with um, are onion skins. I've used black walnut hulls, uh, hulls 
um, spinach. Let's see, I used um, some tea leaves and, oh, blueberries. So I haven't worked with all of these, um, but these are said to be, according to Cornell University, great sources for different colors. Now, of course, I mentioned the black walnut holes. It's always a good idea to wear gloves if you're doing any natural dyeing. Some of these aren't really going to stain your hands, but some of them, like the black walnut, you will have stained hands for days. So keep that in mind. Good idea to wear gloves if you're working with any of these. So the first thing is to prep your fabric. So when you read about dyeing, um, you'll read about using a mordant. So mordant is a French word, I believe that means to bite. So you can kind of think of the mordant as um, a substance that is allowing your dye to kind of bite onto the fabric or to uh, fixate to it and help it to hold the dye longer. So first I should say, if you're using natural dyes, you definitely want to use a natural fabric. So make sure you're using something that's 100% cotton or silk, muslin or wool, something like that. You want to use natural fabric for natural dyes. Um, so you want to prep your fabric with a mordant. And you can go out and buy a mordant um, chemical and do that if you'd like. But again, for the sake of keeping it all natural and simple, um, I have put some natural mordants that you can use. So if you're doing a plant dye, um, such as spinach or onion peels, you want to use a one to four ratio. So one part vinegar and four parts cold water. And if you're doing berries, they recommend using salt. So that's one to 16. So if you're doing you could do eight cups of water and a half cup of salt, depending just on how much of a dye bath you need. Um, so what you're going to do is mix that vinegar and water or salt and water together and bring it to a boil and then add your fabric and put it on simmer and let it simmer for about an hour. Again, there are lots of varying methods that are similar to this online you know, or in books on natural dyeing. So I encourage you to look more into it if it's something um, you're really interested in, play around because lots of different methods as far as how long you boil or simmer, simmer and whatnot, but this is what I have tried and this is kind of what I've seen somewhat consistently. So of course, the more, the more dye or the more vegetables and fruits you use and the longer you let these things soak, it's generally going to be better. Um, so you could do it less than an hour, but I would go the full hour. So after you've let the, the fabric kind of simmer in that mordant for an hour, you're going to uh, let it cool and then take out the fabric and let it dry. Um, I have read where some, sometimes folks will mix the mordant with the dye, but I haven't tried that. Um, so I, I don't think the fabric actually needs to be dried out to then put in the dye bath, but um, I have read that it sometimes holds the color better. So what you could do is after you're finished um, soaking it in the mordant, you hang it to dry and during that time, you can start preparing your dye bath. So with this, all you're going to do is take your fruit or plant parts, whatever you're using, um, and you kind of crush it up or chop it up because you really want to kind of break it up so it'll release that pigment and then add it to your dye bath, your water, boil it for about 30 minutes to an hour. Again, I always say longer is better. Um, so I want the full hour when I've done this. Um, and as it's boiling, it will just release that, release that pigment. So maybe more of kind of a, yeah, a gentle or a simmer, a gentle boil. Um, as long as it's getting hot enough, it'll start rele releasing that pigment. Um, I didn't put measurements on here because it really depends what you're using. I tried to go with at least about a cup of my plant parts um, for each of these, but you can see I have different size um, pots. So um, some of them made a little more, some less. I don't think there's one specific measurement that is right. Um, because again, it really just kind of depends. Do you want to go for a darker shade from the blueberries? Do you want it to be a little bit of a softer shade? You know, if you want softer, add um, more water. If you want it to be more vibrant, add less water. So you can kind of play around with that. After you've extracted the pigment, then you're just going to let it cool down and strain it so that you can separate the plant parts from your dye bath. So you can see over here, um, these were, this is spinach, this was yellow onions. One of these was red onions and blueberries. I think this was a red onions and blueberries. Um, I will warn you, if you're doing onions, prepare to have a house, a home that smells like onions for a while after that, after boiling them for an hour. Um, but so then you have your dyes and you can soak your materials in the dyes. 
So I have read that it's uh, generally recommended to kind of soak, emerge, uh, submerge, I'm sorry, the fabric into the dye. Um, but I didn't make a whole lot. So I did more kind of like a drizzle, like tie dye method with these. Um, so you can see here, I just took some different, I tried like some shibori techniques and um, did some different tying techniques with bandanas and an old sweatshirt. And this one I had soaked a little longer, this long one in the blueberry. Um, but again, I didn't have enough to really just merge them all in it. So I kind of soaked them and then drizzled some on. But again, the more submerged it is and the longer it sits, it's more likely to be more vibrant and hold that dye longer. So I let these sit overnight. I've read where you can do it, you know, for four hours if you're short on time. But again, the longer, more likely the better. So I let these all kind of soak overnight and then um, took off the rubber bands and rinsed them. I've read where you can do cold or warm water. I would recommend if it's not something you're going to be wearing, you know, using more kind of for art, keeping it cool. Um, you definitely moving forward from there, want to always wash it, you know, in cold water in the future. So you want to give it one like warm wash to get, you know, some of that plant smell out, but then um, it's important to wash it in cold water. So these were some others I did too, I soaked in tea. Um, and this is, this is kind of what came out with the blueberry and the onion peels. The spinach did show up a little better. It's kind of hard to see in the sliding, um, but I think I, if I would have crushed the spinach and let it go a little bit longer, or crushed it more, um, maybe it would have been a darker green, but I don't know, it was my first time using spinach. But you can see those purples and reds really came out well. So that's all with dyeing. Track of time here. Um, yeah, and just remember to, you know, then always use the cold water to wash it. So next I'm gonna talk a little bit about printmaking. So a little history on printmaking. Uh, the oldest known example was from the Han Dynasty in China between 2006 BC and 220 AD. Um, if you're not sure what I mean by printmaking, there are lots of different types of it. Basically printmaking is just uh, transferring um, a picture onto a surface. Um, lots of different ways you can do that. So it could be stenciling as a form of printmaking, uh, stamping also, um, even engraving, wood cutting, etching, um, and relief, which is uh, when you do kind of a collage and then um, kind of use that to print onto another surface. Um, but lots of different examples. So you can see I mean, right off the top, wood cutting, engraving, etching are all things you could do pretty easily outdoors, you know, with the right tool and different sticks or wood that you find. Um, but I'm going to look a little bit more about using other plant parts to do some of these. So one of the first and easiest ones is simply making stamps out of sweet potatoes. So to do this, all you need is a sweet potato or even a piece of a sweet potato. Carve you something to carve with, so a paring knife could work great. Um, you could even try like pumpkin carving kits, you know, if you're having the students carve their own, you don't want them to use knives. Um, paint and then whatever you're stamping onto. So very basic. Um, if you're using a knife, if you're doing, creating the stamps, um, the best method is to, once you have the potato, um, kind of score it, put your design in, and then from the side of the potato, chop it. If that or cut it, if that makes sense. Um, I wish I had a potato in front of me to show that, but um, yeah, so that's gonna be easier if you, you, know, you kind of cut in your design and then again, turn it to the side and just cut off those outer pieces to get that stamp image. And voila, you have a stamp. So you can do this on fabric, paper, whatever you like. And I would encourage you to even maybe try, try making stamps with other vegetables out in the garden too. So you see how different ones work. Another printmaking activity is hammered floral prints with natural pigments. So I'll show you some examples in just a minute. But basically all you need for that is some paper, like some cardstock. Um, I would recommend using something a little thicker like cardstock, um, a hammer, or you could even use, you know, if you're outside and you don't want, you don't have a bunch of hammers or what your students using hammers, something like a big heavy rock, anything that they can pound with um, and natural materials. So very simple, and you don't have to use paper, you could use cloth too, um, if you want to imprint the pigments onto fabric. 
So basically all you're going to do is take your paper, lay it down, put your plant parts on top of the paper. And it's a good idea to put them face down or wherever you want the pigment to come out of. So like here I have some Japanese maple leaves and you know, they look green, but on the other side, they're purple. And I really wanted to get that purple pigment. So I put that face down um, and I think some geraniums. So basically you put them down on the paper and then you put another piece of paper on top of it, or you could put them down on cloth and just put something else thick on top of it. And then you're just going to hammer. So you just hammer down and you'll start to see even the colors kind of come through. You can see over here on the left um, that this piece over on the left was on top of this um, and the colors kind of started to come through. So you must get double, double the art. Um, so once you kind of start seeing them and you can peek and keep going, you know, if you want more color to come out, then you just gently you can use tweezers, pull off your plant parts and you're left with something like this over here. So I, I did it one time and I, I noticed these cool fun kind of like the maple, the Japanese maple, these red lines and they almost kind of made me think of like fireworks. So I decided to layer a few more on and it did add a little more, um, but I really liked the colors that came from the geraniums. And if you look close enough, you know, if you can see in this picture, you can really see like the inside of the geraniums where they're white and they have little stripes. You can really see some of that design. Um, but I would encourage you to, again, just try out different um, different plants. Some of them are going to work a lot better than others. And I would say, I, I would assume that plants that are good for dyes um, would also be good for this because they have those strong pigments that can come out of the plant, um, but play around with it. So some things that I've tried, I know marigolds tend to give a really good color for this activity. Um, I showed you the Japanese maple leaves, kind of put out where the veins are, that, those red lines. Um, green herbs work really well, uh, geraniums, dandelions, um, periwinkle. You'll see this one I did. So another thing you can do is create, um, you can kind of document what you have growing in the garden. So you'll see I did, I placed down a parsley leaf, a basil leaf, some mountain mint and sage. So this was the one I placed them face down on and then I covered them with this piece of paper and hammered it down. And this is what I got. And I really liked this one, the mountain mint, you can see showed up a lot more on the other side. So I don't know if I had it placed the wrong way or just released the pigment more on that side. Um, but I really like how you can see the texture in this too. So you can see that sage, you can really see kind of those bumps that you, you see on sage leaves. And I love the parsley, it came out so cute. Um, and it doubles as almost a scratch and stuff too, because it's, it's all herb, herbs. Um, but I think this is also a fun way for students to kind of document, you know, what they have growing maybe in the garden and maybe help them to remember or identify herbs because, you know, once they kind of see this, then they can think when they're in the garden, oh, the sage is the bumpy one you know, or the parsley, you know, has, is the cute one. <laughs> I don't know how I want to describe that, um, but I really liked the way the herbs turned out. The greens really showed up well. Um, the last printmaking activity I have is plant imprints. So this is not a whole lot different than the last one, but instead you're just kind of uh, transferring the outline or um, the design from the plant, just using paint, kind of using it as a stamp. So basically all you're going to need is some paint, um, some kind of scrap paper, um, paintbrush or a sponge, something like this works good, um, depending on what kind of plant parts you're using. Um, and then paper or fabric to put your image onto, and then tweezers and whatever natural materials. So basically all you're going to do for this is, if you look over on the left, that was a Thanksgiving cactus um, leaf. And I would encourage you to use stuff that's outside in the garden, but I was working with a lot of house plants when I was creating these demos. Um, so this is just a leaf, two leaves from a Thanksgiving cactus. And I painted, I just covered them in paint and then put them, put it face down onto paper, put a piece of paper over it and just use my hand to press that paint onto it. So here I had a Japanese maple leaf, the Thanksgiving cactus, and then this was part of a fern. So this is, this one's kind of fun because you can just play around with different shapes. So, you know, you, you can, I thought the fern almost kind of reminded me of a fish. So it's almost like there's a little mouth and have a little eye. So you could, you know, let students do this and then let them 
turn into like mixed media, then they can draw on it, you know, see what images they, they kind of see from, from these stamps. Um, you know, I could turn that into a picture of a fish swimming, swimming in the water. Um, let's see, I'm just let's my train of thought. Um, but yeah, I mean, how, however you want to use that. Um, but it is good to have tweezers to pick up those plant parts from the paper. So that way you're not kind of smearing paint in other, other places that you don't want it. Anything else we can say about that? Um, okay. So that's all with weaving, dyeing, and printmaking. So I just want to share our last few final activities that you can do out in the garden. And then if we have time for any uh, questions or comments, we will take those at the end. So just a few, three or four um, last activities that I've done that students seem to like. One, and this one works really well with really young students, um, it's just painting with mud. Again, you can tie it to you know, a history lesson and talk about a caveman that would you know, paint in the caves with, with mud. Um, but it's really easy, involves very little, um, very few materials, a little cleanup, but basically you just have your paper. And again, I would recommend like construction paper or cardstock, something a little thicker um, that isn't going to disintegrate if it gets kind of wet. Um, a little bit of non-toxic paint if you want to add some color to it and mud. So basically for this, we just chuck some mud and put it in a bowl or I guess I should say soil and put it in a bowl and turn it into mud by adding a little water to whatever consistency you want. And then we wanted to just kind of have a few different colors. So I just took some um, non-toxic paint and mixed just a, just a little bit in with the mud. So you can kind of see where we have a little bit of red mud here. We also had some blue. Um, and then either a paintbrush or you could get really creative. Oh, I thought I had a picture of it on here. I did take a picture. I guess I didn't put it on here. Um, and make a paintbrush using, using a stick and like pine needles. So you could just take a stick and if you have like a bunch of pine needles, um, just attaching them to the end of the stick and binding it with twine. And then you have a natural paintbrush that students can use. And it can make some fun, um, some fun designs too with the pine needles. So and that's one quick activity you can do outside and then just leave them out to dry. Um, also, I've talked about this one before in another webinar, but making mandalas. So I've done this um, more for kind of meditation in the garden, but it's obviously could be a great art project too. So this just involves natural materials you have outside. If you want to do it as kind of a impermanent art activity, um, you can do it like I have pictured here where students just go around and collect uh, different items in the garden. And again, this is great when you're teaching about symmetry. Um, and, you know, and we're basically, you know, I talked a little bit about you know, the history of mandalas and what they represent. Um, but the only rule was that their um, mandala had to be kind of symmetrical. These were kindergartners, so there's symmetry for the most part. Um, but, you know, we just, we started with the center point. I told them to have a center piece and then we just built off of it um, with different shapes and colors and just creating a symmetrical um, piece of artwork. And again, these weren't permanent and they weren't attached to anything. And that was kind of the point of the lesson to just enjoy it while it lasted and then let it do its thing, let it blow away in the wind or decompose. Um, but you could, I would think this would work just as well if you want to actually adhere the, the items to, you know, a piece of paper with glue or however you might that, want that to look. Another popular one for the garden, seed mosaics. So you could do this on paper. You could also cover um, like a flower pot with a seed mosaic. I mean, you could cover pretty much anything. So this one, all you need are seeds. And if you um, are in a, the St. Louis area and would like to get your hands on bulk seeds to use for something like this, feel free to reach out to Gateway Greening because um, we always have old season seeds that we tend to just give um, to different for teachers um, for art projects and things like that. So feel free to reach out to me if you would like to get your hands on some seeds for this. Um, and again, you're just, you could either kind of have students sketch out the design beforehand um, and then use glue where they sketched. Um, 
kind of for like color by color. So for this, like for the B, um, started with the pink lines and put the glue there first and covered it with those seeds and then kind of let that dry and then did the next color, um, you know, then added the eyes and so on. So lots of different methods. You could give them popsicle sticks to use, you know, to dip the glue in um, and to cover, you know, a flower pot and just place the seeds in whatever pattern they want along the pot and then kind of spray it to seal it. Um, you could also mix this in. You can see on this one with the flower, the leaves were colored um, with, I don't even remember, some kind of herb. So kind of mixing the, the printmaking activity along with this. You could even try, you know, maybe using some natural dyes or drizzling them on and see what kind of effect that gives. And then the last one, I don't have a picture of, but a clay stone imprint. So you could do this just for creating like little rocks to put around the garden or even for stepping stones. So very simple, just taking your clay um, and getting different natural items and pressing them in and letting those dry. And again, they make great decorative pieces. You could use them even as um, like signs for the garden or mark to mark, you know, maybe what's growing where. Um, you know, if you want to press a parsley leaf in and maybe write parsley and let it dry and use that, you know, where the parsley is growing and so on. So that is all the activities I have. I actually thought it's been around, going to run out of time. Hopefully I didn't move too quickly through it. Um, I wish I would have added more, but we have about 10 more minutes. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments, again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or if you have comments or things you've tried or great resources for Art in the Garden, um, you can drop them in the chat. Give you all just a minute. If we don't have any, we will end early. So I would be really curious to see here any 